Welcome to Eat, Sleep, Wine, Repeat, a podcast for all you wine lovers who, if you're like me, just cannot get enough of the good stuff. I'm Yanina Doyle, your host, brand ambassador, wine educator, and sommelier. So stick with me as we dive deeper into this ever-evolving, wonderful world of wine. And wherever you are listening to this, cheers to you. Hello, wine friends, and welcome back to part two with Master of Wine and Burgundy expert Jasper Morris. Now, this episode, we're going to get stuck into those wine regions. So going from top to bottom, we will touch on the great variety Aligotti. Jasper will mention some of his personal favourites when it comes to the Grand Cruise. And of course, I couldn't have Jasper around without asking him where we get the value. So the good news, everyone, there are some great places to find those affordable wines. And hopefully after this episode, you will feel more comfortable seeking them out. So if you haven't already got yourself a bottle of Bourgogne, pour yourself something tasty, maybe get a pen and paper to take some notes, or of course, download the transcript, which you can find at the top of my show notes. And let's get stuck in. Enjoy. So tell me now, are there any new players on the Burgundy scene that that you could recommend to anybody? Yes, I mean, uh, there are actually lots. It's fascinating. Every year, um, uh, I'm not going to single out any sort of one or two particular ones, Mm. uh, but it is brilliant to see it spreading. And the narrative at the moment with the cost of the wines and the cost of the land, it's only the huge, great international companies, uh, rich foreigners who can buy uh, into Burgundy in terms of uh, of buying up some of the domains and some of the vineyards. But I'm also finding lots of people who are just, coming in from outside, starting for the first time, not necessarily begun, it's not necessarily French. Oh, that's uh, interesting. There's, there's a bunch of, um, I was going to say young, but younger than me, Australians, <laughs> who have made a bit, of a bit of a go of it. Uh, no reason why there shouldn't be English people. There are people from all around the world who come into Burgundy, started by hiring a corner of someone else's cellar and buying a few grapes. And then a, if they make good wine, then somebody rents them a vineyard and, and, and so it goes. So, yes, but what is also true is that nowadays the less well-known villages, which probably didn't have more than one or two good producers in there and probably weren't getting their grapes quite ripe enough in earlier days, they're now doing really, really well. Mm. So you can look for appellations like Saint-Romain, Auxerre-Duresse and Montelis yes. mm-hmm. uh, in the Côte de Beaune, Marcenay in the Côte de Nuit and indeed Côte de Nuit village. Loads of um, Macon village from small producers. And nowadays, there's a huge amount of choice. And the secret, if you really want to get into it, is in a restaurant, don't go to Burgundy unless you can see that that restaurant really cares about Burgundy. Yeah, okay. Um, Mm -hmm. Equally, if you want to buy, it's not really a supermarket thing because the wines get too expensive too quickly in the UK. But go to an independent, again, who shows that they care about Burgundy. Mm. And... The wine magazines, when they talk about sort of Burgundy, it's always the same names of, uh, there are at least a dozen of them in the UK, importers often who who sell the wines online, even if they don't have a bricks and mortar shop. So you've got the grand classics like uh, Berry Brothers and uh, Jastrinian Brooks and, and so on. Uh, and you've got some um, individual shops like sort of Swig in London, uh, Leon Sanderman. Uh, I, I shouldn't really have started naming names because I will forget <laughs> some and I've mentioned others. Flint is an excellent importer who have a, a retail wine site as well and so on and so forth. There are loads yeah. of them. Uh, my my former boss, Johnny Goodhouse, his company as well. So you need to buy Burgundy from somebody who's understood it. Yeah, okay. Otherwise, okay. It, there's too much money involved for it to be worth the risk. And I mean, you've kind of touched on a few places where I think you're suggesting that's better value. So you said like Macon, the Macon Village. I, I yes. was drinking a really, you know, Louis Latour is obviously a big name and, and easily accessible for people. I was drinking a Macon Ludny the other day. That yep, was that's the classic from Louis Latour. Ab- <laughs> I think it was uh, seventeen pound a bottle, eighteen pound a bottle. I thought that was a fantastic example of Chardonnay um, for that yeah. price point. Would you say for people after good value Chardonnay, a Macon Village is a good? 
place to it's, start. It's certainly a good place. And indeed, there's straight Chablis uh, uh, as well that can be really good. And Chablis mm. is an area, with a couple of exceptions, but in general, the good producers don't cost a lot more than the, the sort of more generic ones. What I would suggest, though, is wherever your budget is, buy the best of a lower appellation rather than something that looks a bit cheap from a more famous name. Okay, that's, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because there's actually a lot of Premier crews out there that are not, well, it's, you know, I suppose, when was the Appalachian system created? In the 1930s? 1930s was for the Appalachians, i.e. the names of the villages and the Grand Crews at the same time. And then the sort of classification of Premier crew came in during the Second World War, um, when the, the German authorities said that they might requisition any vineyards if they needed the land for something else, but they wouldn't if it was of crew status. Oh, so interesting. The, existed already the Grand Cruise, so they suddenly invented lots of Premier <laughs> Cruise. <laughs> and then that maybe makes sense. Like, uh, there are now some Premier Cruise that are even as good as, possibly even a few better than Grand Cruise, yeah. and then there's lots of probably very mediocre <laughs> Premier Cruise as well. well that's right. There? But two things to give a bit of guidance on that. One is that you have your rating, your classification, based on the potential of the piece of land and not about the fame of you as a producer. So in Bordeaux, it's about Chateau La Tour, Chateau Lafitte, etc. Mm-hmm. In Burgundy, it's this bit of vineyard land, it doesn't matter who owns it, has the potential to make a wine of either very good or truly outstanding quality. (laughs) Now, the problem here is it doesn't tell you whether the particular producer whose bottle you can see on the shelves in front of you has done a good job or not. So it's not a guarantee of of quality uh, beyond the bare minimum. Um, Afterwards, you have to know how well your producer has done, um, Mm -hmm. which is why you have to either follow really good merchants or, or follow uh, the critics. Could you just explain the wine classification structure of Burgundy? We've obviously said Grand Cru is the top. Then yeah. Premier Cru, you said, has come out a little bit <laughs> later. Okay, well, let's say you're standing on the main road, which has been blocked off from traffic, but there's a main road that goes from Dijon through Beaune, Louis Saint-Georges, Beaune, puligny Maraschais, and then so that's about the end of uh, chassin Maraschais. That's the end of the Côte d'Or. But if you're look, standing on that road mm-hmm. and you can see a bit of vineyards, the sun behind you some alongside you and those will be in quite deep rich soil and they've been classified as generic burgundy so they'll say bourgoin rouge or bourgoin pinot noir bourgoin Mm -hmm. blanc bourgoin chardonnay on the label yeah or we have the uh, two other minor grapes uh aligothe which we should talk about a bit later uh and in red uh there might be some gamay involved but okay so these are what we call the generic or regional burgundies Mm mm-hmm Then as you look in front of you, you can see the buildings of the various villages and the vineyards on this level, where it's flattish, but you're just beginning to get a bit of upward slope. These will be the village level wines, and you may see them just named after their village, let's say Volnay or Mm Merceau, or you might see them named after the village, but also a vineyard name attached. So it could be, for example, Merceau Chevalier would be one particular name, or Merceau Mm -hmm. Tesson. Um, but we're still at a village level. Now, at the sweet spot on the slope, you get the classified growths or crew, premier crew, first growth, mm-hmm. grand crew, great growth. And we'll park the grand crew for a minute and we'll talk about the premier yeah. crews. So these are pretty much the best wines of uh, the village and they'll be at mid slope on the hill. And if you go higher still, you get back to being at village level because you haven't got quite enough topsoil. They're quite good, but they don't fulfill the criteria for best results. Mm -hmm. Now, amongst our sweet spot section, the mostly premier crews, a few vineyards are so exciting that they have a flavour profile of their own instead of just being the best example of what that village tastes like. So these then carry their own name. And what gets confusing is that most of the villages have hyphenated their own uh, yes. uh, hyphenated <laughs> name of their best vineyard. So the best one in uh, Gevray, it was called Chambotin. So you have a village called Gevray Chambotin. Yep. <laughs> but then you get others. And in Faune Romanet, you have La Romanet Conti and La Romanet. But you also have Richebourg and Grand Cru and La Tache, uh, which are Grand Cru's which stand apart. Now, really, in the in these days of horrible prices, those are the wines which have become truly uh, unaffordable. <laughs> the most expensive so, in the world, basically, right? I, yes. And I'm just looking at the opening prices for the 2021 vintage being offered by merchants now. And some of these are 500, 700, even 1500 pounds a bottle. 
on first release uh, yes. without VAT <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. from from the producers. And then you can look at one of the wine comparison sites and you can see mature vintages changing in the secondary market for several thousand pounds a bottle. And it's completely crazy. Um, <sighs> you know, we, are, we are talking crushed grapes here. But, uh, an, yeah, an agricultural product. It's an but, agricultural yeah. pro- product, but it is um, in Burgundy just about the best in the world. And since we have had everybody completely attuned to looking things up on the web, you can compare prices everywhere. The Burgundy wines are made in much smaller quantities than the great Bordeaux's. So there is no stock available. And if somebody yeah, floats scarcity. the price out there mm-hmm. at a ludicrous mm-hmm. level, somebody then assumes that's the genuine market value and other people match it. So so that's what's sort of gone wrong in, in recent years. Kicked off by the wonderful 2005 vintage. And by that point, communications were already becoming very sophisticated. And it's, it's really only got more and more. So when I started out as a wine importer and, and we got excited by Burgundy, it was really, really difficult to sell it uh, through the 80s and into the 90s. And our company got known as being probably the best uh, wine importers at that particular po- mm-hmm. point. Sorry, Burgundy wine importers, I should say. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we sort of won the annual Best Burgundy Wine Merchant uh, Award. And it got a bit better. And things were in the middle to late 90s. Things were in equilibrium. But the the famous saying, be careful what you wish for. Since (laughs) around about the launch of 2005 vintage, it's just become impossible. The the balance is all about demand rather than supply because they ain't making vineyard land anymore. uh, So you can't really increase production. Your holdings, yeah. And now, of course, every country in the world, um, uh, the the rich wine lovers in every country in the world have understood how good Burgundy can be and they all want to be part of it. So that genie is well and truly out of the bottle. But it doesn't (sighs) mean to say you can't have beautiful wines made at, at much lower price levels from these vineyards which are producing better wines than ever before. Ah, actually, to finish off on that best value talk, shall we say, we kind of said Macon for people would be yeah. a good place for Chardonnay. Where would you, I know you've already said it's much better to find a higher quality kind of village wine rather than a cheap version of a, say, a Premier Cru. Where yeah. maybe could people go? I know you mentioned Saint Romain for a for a Pinot Noir. Where yeah, else Saint Romain it? It does both colours. It's probably better yeah. known for the whites and the reds, ah, but okay, you'll find okay. reds. But mm-hmm. Ossé Duress and Montelis um, uh, and Marcinet would be other excellent villages. And you can buy things just labelled Bourgogne Rouge, which uh, come from growers um, and they're next door to their village vineyards, uh, and they're way cheaper. Plus, with global warming, the areas up in the hills behind, the Haute Côte de Beaune and the Haute Côte de Nuit, are yeah, starting to be much properly better. interesting too. So, so there is lots to, to find. Okay, uh, And if we just go back to the whites, we did touch on it. But there is now an alternative grape. It's existed forever. It's a much Aha. older grape variety than Chardonnay. Yes. I can hear your enthusiasm. It's Aligotti. Aligotti. Yeah. So that used to be really nasty, lean, green, mean. And people would make the drink Kier by or Creme Blanc Cassis by putting in the, that sort of sweet mm-hmm. black currant cordial into it, or black currant liqueur. And you needed to because the wine was just way too acid. Uh, Prickly, no? Yeah. Sharp. Mm. So uh, that's changed because with your same Aligote grapes, they are now ripening much better. And as you come through to harvest, hope you hope in September, but possibly these days more often in August, if you wait too long for your Chardonnay, you're suddenly getting into your 15 degrees and so on. Whereas Aligote at the same time that the Chardonnay hits 14 and a half, the Aligote is hitting 12, 12 and a half, but its flavours are mature. Uh, right. Mm-hmm. So it's becoming properly interesting. We've got three or four producers now who are specializing in doing single vineyard eligotes. And it's become clear that this grape will translate the potential of the terroir every bit as well as Chardonnay does. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, I'm going to ask you in a little bit to run through all the appellations, but I think a fantastic version, I'm sure you will agree, is in Bousseron. And that is where the Aligotti seems to be best. And Domain AEP, the Villain, is making, I think, a bottle for £30. So again, an excellent example of Aligotti that's affordable enough. 
Yes. Reachable for people. Mm. Yeah, they aren't the only ones, but they are supreme producers of this. And remember that uh, de Villain, the family de Villain, they are the co-owners of Domaine de la Romani Conti. Mm -hmm. So if you do a quick Google for a bottle of Romani Conti <laughs> of the year of your choice, you know, you, you, you're up Good into luck. the sort of the 20,000s or something. But they also, their home sort of private um, uh, domain, they make these beautiful wines, uh, reds and whites yeah. of Pinot and Chardonnay, but also Aligote from the village they're based in, which is called Bouzeron. So that's mm. the only village which has its an appellation specifically for the Aligoté grape. Yes, good. Shall we... Well, actually, no, you warmed me up, and I'm just now going to talk about <laughs> uh, a memorable bottle. It wasn't quite the same way that you've suggested that you might have a memorable bottle that okay. convinces you that Burgundy's the place. I mm -hmm. mean, I had uh, it, it was coming to Burgundy and meeting the people that really did that. But I think that the bottles that have given me the most pleasure are those where there is an element of emotion in them, as mm. well as the innate quality of the wine. Of course. And to celebrate, I think it was the 89th birthday of the late and very much lamented great wine producer from uh, Volnay, Michel Lafarge. At his house, we were a small group of us were having dinner, and his son, Frederick, was sort of pulling the wines out. And they just served in 1962 Volnay Clé de Chêne, which is probably their best premier crew. And it was a truly, truly sensational bottle of wine. And then Frederick went off to the back of the cellar and he came back and he put a bottle in front of his father and showed it to him. And a huge grin spread over Michel Lafarge's uh, face. And you've got to remember uh -huh. this guy was 89 at the time. And Michel said, that's a wine my grandfather made. And it was oh. just that moment of pure yeah. magic. It was a 1915 mm -hmm. Volnay Premier Cru. And oh it, it wasn't anything like as good a wine as the 1962, but just the extraordinary moment to have been there and to have enjoyed that with him was, I mean, was, was just truly sensational. These are time capsules, aren't they? Wine is a Absolutely. time capsule. Oh, yeah. beautiful. Thank you. There you go. I got a memory out of you. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Now, let's do this. Can we look at a rundown of the regions from the Côte d'Or, the Côte Chalonnaise and the Maconnaise and just kind of maybe a little bit of a just run through so people can understand where everything is. Okay, so what so what did Chablis do wrong? So we, we need to include Chablis as well. Well, the reason Chablis hasn't done anything wrong is I feel like I'm going to dedicate a whole episode to Chablis oh, at, sure. some, at some okay. point. It right. deserves its own episode. It is part of Burgundy, but it is so far apart, very, very yes. different, the Chardonnay coming from there. So Chablis has not done anything wrong. You're fine. Oh, all right, good. <laughs> it's true that when I'm up in Chablis tasting with the producers, they say, uh, you know, so what's happening down in Burgundy uh, <laughs> or en Bourgogne? So, so yes, it is a part, but it's lovely. So, if we start then with the Cote d'Or, uh, the yes. two halves of it, Cote de Nuit, as you come out of Dijon, and for years people have been grabbing up the vineyards in order to uh, build little houses uh, in what could have been, has been vineyard uh, land, and now the vines mm. are becoming worth more than the houses are, so <laughs> you almost get the impression Tough people are going to start knocking the houses down and replanting vines. Wouldn't that be I nice? wonder how that would affect <laughs> the soil, having put... Uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be great, but still. Uh, yeah. um, it's an experiment. It's, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so you start to drive south out of Dijon, almost everything is red, uh, yeah. You have the first village called Marsnay, which is famous, um, though very small production, for really good rosé from Pinot Noir. But you must drink that rosé as a food wine at table and give it a couple of years bottle age. It's not to be drunk like a, a sort of Provençal rosé on a mm -hmm, hot day. Yeah. So you're mostly reds, and it's a really pure hedonistic form of Pinot Noir and run rapidly through the villages. Like it's a great roll call. Chevry uh, okay. Chambertin, Murray Saint-Denis, Chambol Musny for its elegance, Vougeot, famous Clos Vougeot, Grand Cru, uh, Vaughan Romanet, the grandest well, of all. Yes, there's and so many Grand Cru. Louis Saint-Georges. And, and that, that uh, sorts you out with the Cote de Nuit. Uh, and then after that, there's sort of, um, feels like a bump in the road as you're driving along, if that. <laughs> But otherwise, you couldn't tell. You just go seamlessly from the Cote de Nuit into the Cote de Bone. Mm -hmm. It's a, an artificial uh, change, in fact, due to uh, where a particular uh, medieval bishopric uh, changed from one to another. Uh, and then okay. you come to the, the Hill of Corton, famous for its two uh, Grand Crus, Corton in red, which can also have various single vineyard names attached, and Corton Charlemagne in white. And there's a tedious legend uh, because part of the vineyard we know belonged to the Emperor Charlemagne, 
and theoretically his his wife was fed up with him going out drinking with the boys and getting red wine stains on his beard and on his tiger and so she said <laughs> if you're going to drink wine, wine drink white wine so <laughs> anyway believe that if you wish to never um, let the truth get in the way of a good story <laughs> exactly uh then burn itself the headquarters where all the big merchants are are based and yes. the reputation of the vines is um or wines has been a little bit lost. I think they probably deserve better than they're a bit more love than they're getting. Then you have Pomar, Volney, two beautiful appellations of which Volney has been my favourite for the longest time. But with global okay. warming, Volney is at risk, maybe, of drying out a bit, whereas Pomar, which used to be a little bit rough and tannic, uh, those rough tannins are getting ripe now, and so Pomar is really going up. So there is a slight okay, change mm-hmm. in the hierarchy as we get into warmer times. And then you have the little area of the famous white villages, Merceau, then Puligny, hyphenated Morachet, and Chassain, hyphenated Morachet. And attached to that, um, more in the style of Puligny or Chassain, you have Saint-Aubin, which used to be regarded as a second division village, but now is making beautiful wines, and the prices haven't gone up too much yet. Okay, bit of value there then. Okay. Yeah, Mm -hmm. plus alongside those, but sat mostly a little bit further back, uh, the three I mentioned before is Good Value, Montley, Osidurus, and Saint-Romain. And right at the end, uh, you've actually come out of the, the Cote d'Or department, but you're still in the Cote d'Or as far as wines are concerned. You have Sontenay, great reds, and some quite nice whites, and rather forgotten about, and can be exciting, Marange. Um, oh, Marange. Uh, right I... at the end, stuck okay. on the end. Like Marcenay is the first in the north, Marange is the last in the south. Well, we're a rather beautiful country and there's some good value to be had there. Okay, interesting. And then you drift seamlessly into uh, the Cote Chalonnaise. The first village is actually Bouzeron that you mentioned, uh, tucked away yes. in the side valley. It's almost impossible to find. There are only tiny little roads that come out oh, really? of uh, obscure other roads uh, to get there. How are the signposts in Burgundy? Are they um, terrible? Moderate. <laughs> <laughs> you say that with a laugh. Okay, all right. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and then you have the Coach Chalonnaise, which regularly gets sort of rediscovered and then slightly re-forgotten. It's needed a few sort of locomotive producers to uh, make it kick on and, and get more fame. But people are definitely looking there more now because the prices have remained reasonable. And I think I have seen just in the last five years an uptick in quality. But there are five villages in all. Bouzeron, just for Aligote. Ruli, which is both red and white, but probably more thought of for white. Mm-hmm. Mercure and Givry, which are both red and white and have the most structured wines of the region. And they are both more red wine, but with, let's say, 10% of whites, um, which are quite uh, interesting. And then finally, Montani at the southern end, which is purely white. There was a period it was purely Premier Cru, because that's where they, they started out with the, the threats from the German occupiers. Oh, interesting. And uh, also it has a type of mix of the soil, which just gives you a small amount of the flavour profile of Chablis. Only a very small amount, oh, but Montani. it just has a tiny okay. bit of that sort of marine uh, freshness to it. Okay, so that's Montani mm-hmm. could be fun from that point of view. Okay. But then there's a small gap and you come to the Maconnais. The northern part of the region is mostly Macon village, where you get good value wines from the big cooperatives, like the cooperative at Luni and at Vire, and uh, also some of the big negociants have um, taken advantage of those sorts of wines. And you mentioned Louis Latour mm-hmm. um, for his Macon Luni. But you get small growers as well. And in this part of the world, the wines are really not expensive and they could be fabulous. Great place to explore in on a summer holiday. Okay. And there's one little uh, mini appellation making slightly richer wines called Vire Classé. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Then you get <laughs> to... Then you get to the famous Puy Fuisse and its satellite of saint Véron, And Puy Fuisse goes in and out of fashion, uh, in and up and down in price. But really, there are some fairly magical wines can be made there. And in a funny way, they're not suffering from global warming as much because you expect Puy Fuisse to be well, it was always quite richer. rich, quite heavy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So the slight additional heat has not really changed the natural profile of what Puy Fuisse is about. Mm. But you do get styles. If you're in the hamlet of Fuisse, they're richer. If you're in the hamlet of Vergisson, they're all part of the same appellation. You're further up in the hills and you've got cooler air currents. So you do get stylistic differences. Okay. And then suddenly the Chardonnay finishes. End of Chardonnay, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. start of granite, beginning of the Beaujolais, and you get something which is completely different, but still sort of part of Greater Burgundy. 
<laughs> exactly. But it's, that's why I suppose I've decided I'll knock off Beaujolais for another episode and knock yeah. off Chablis for another episode because they are kind of separate, aren't they? Now, you Indeed. mentioned climate change. And of course, this is, again, another conversation that could take us a few hours. But how is that in terms of the fact that we have kind of that mid-slope area that has always been known to be the best? And of course, the upper slopes were not as good because they were a bit too cool. Obviously, the soil was it was more rocky anyway. But the coolness, they would take a week later maybe to ripen and they wouldn't have the same concentration. But now, are you finding there's a lot more of those those upper sites that are producing some fantastic wine is it kind of shifting yes but it isn't absolutely straightforward so yeah, first impression <laughs> first impression of global warming it's getting more interesting at the top of the slopes okay but nothing is suffering and no one's going down in estimation mm-hmm. since then with more extreme global warming things have changed a little bit And the vineyards at the top of the slopes often have very little topsoil, so they don't retain the water, so they're at risk of drying out. And some of the vineyards, which in the past we liked particularly because they were early ripening sites, so they were actually more consistent, more successful more often than not, are now definitely in danger. In years like 2018 or 2020, they will have suffered. But instead, the bottom of the slope, the bits which are in Bourgogne country, which have much deeper soils, greater humidity, or appellations like Pomar, which had a little bit too much humidity in the soil, mm-hmm. bits of Chauvichambata, they are at the moment really benefiting. Yeah. But look, it needs to stop where we are now. If global warming continues as some people, to the extent that some people fear, then it is going to become problematic, yeah. for sure. And you're going to need to write a third book. <laughs> Completely yes, on, on the great Pinot Noirs of the South Downs of England. <laughs> we, like well, that. I mean, that's not going to be good for you and the whole love of Burgundy, but I mean, being English, I mean, that's not too bad. But um, coming back to Burgundy, coming back to Burgundy, yeah. I would like to finish on a positive note. Well, positive, a high end note, premium note. So, can I ask you, perhaps for anybody who has got a little bit of extra money f- f- in their bank account, what Grand Cru's do you feel are most consistent or perhaps most exciting right now, maybe? Yes. The point of a Grand Cru is it should be consistent. Yes. Okay. Because it, what we've always said in the past is that a Grand Cru shows its class year in, year out, good vintage or bad vintage. Mm-hmm. And so largely speaking, that remains the case. One or two perhaps are suffering a little bit more. Uh, maybe I'll just talk about a couple of favourites. I have a real weakness for Musigny, um, uh, the, yes, the wine snap. in Chambon Musigny, <laughs> which you, you touched on with your <laughs> the Vogue bottle. Yeah. So that would be, I suppose, my Desert Island uh, Grand Cru in the Reds. Okay. But I, I love uh, many of them. Uh, uh, there are nine Grand Crus in Chevrolet Chambertin, all of whom have Chambertin as part of their name. And a little less lesser known one, which I really love, um, because it's particularly fine bones, to come back to that word, <laughs> is Ruchot Chambata. Okay. But it's only one of many. Okay. And that's a personal point of view rather than a, a clear indication that it's uh, sort of hitting above its weight. Okay. In the whites, you have either Corton Charlemagne or you have the ones with Maraschet in their name. Of course, Maraschet itself is head and shoulders above the others. But you then have this little rundown of Chevalier Maraschet, which is perhaps the most elegant of them. Batar Maraché, the bastard Maraché, which is the <laughs> weightiest in many ways. Okay. Uh, it's got a deeper soil. Mm-hmm. And then next door, there's a little enclave called Bienvenue Batar Maraché, which mm-hmm. you have to love for its name, which would translate as the welcome bastard. Uh, <laughs> I've never even, I knew that, but I've never even thought of that. That's absolutely brilliant, actually. Okay, yeah. And what do you think of the welcome bastard then? Oh, I really like it. It's more accessible than, than Batar. You can drink it when it's younger. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it just has a beautiful, almost cashmere texture. Okay. And I'll put in a word for the Grand Cru's of Chablis, even though I know you're not talking about Chablis We are allowed. Today. Yes, we no, we Okay, so what Grand Cru would you go to for Chablis? Well, that would be uh, Le Clos is the number one, but mm-hmm. I also adore Vaudisier. Okay, perfect. But hey, you shouldn't, you shouldn't just limit me. The whole point about Burgundy is not just to pick out several favourites. It's just to I try know. different wines all the time. And the pleasure I get drinking a really good Eligote or a good Macon or a simple Bourgogne Blanc uh, or indeed the equivalents in reds, they give me so much pleasure. Mm. And I'm just so thrilled to be living in a period in which we've got an amazing amount of choice at that less expensive level. 
Perfect. I love that. Now, thank you so much, Jasper. Uh, for, for people who are now intrigued and understanding as well that, you know, Burgundy is very exciting and there's so much to learn. You also have your website, which I know you mentioned because that, that's where people can find the book as well, or at least where to locate it. That's right. Yes. The, the, what the website is about, because the book, for all its 800 pages, doesn't have a single tasting note in it. It's all, mm, it's mm-hmm, all about mm-hmm. information. But people want to know which producer is doing well, which wine is tasting better. So I put all my tasting notes, several thousand a year, and we've been running for five years. Uh, now go on my InsideBurgundy.com website. Mm. Uh, website, which is, I'm afraid, a subscription website. So you have to pay an annual fee, but then you have access to all those tasting notes. A few bits of basic information like where to find the book you can get without being a subscriber. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm just in the middle of doing all my tasting notes on the 2021 vintage uh, so that they'll be out in time for the various UK wine merchants to launch their offers in the next few days. Perfect. Well, there we go. So for anybody who really just wants to dive in, I highly recommend going to Inside Burgundy and really starting that journey. So Jasper, thank you for just tickling us a little bit with all the good stuff. And I know where to come when I need some Burgundy advice. So thank you. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Yelena. It's been a real pleasure. You take care. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. So that is it. Let me know what did you find most interesting across the last two episodes with Jasper. Get in contact with me by email. That's Yanina, spelt with a J, Yanina at eatsleepwinerepeat.co.uk or on Instagram. My handle is at eatsleep underscore wine repeat. And you know that no episode is complete without a wine quote. So to finish off, I have one from Voltaire, who was a French Enlightenment writer and an advocate for freedom on speech and religion. And he most famously said, I serve your bone to my friends and your volne I keep for myself. Well, I shall leave you to explore both appellations and see if you agree. Next week, we are leaving France and we are heading over to Slovenia. I have wine writer and part-time winemaker Chris Boiling on the podcast. Now, he bought a vineyard in Slovenia in 2009. It wasn't quite the shrewd investment he had once hoped for, but it has kickstarted a very interesting wine project. Well, all will be revealed, but you will come away next week knowing more about this lesser known wine region. Don't forget, as always, if you have a few moments to leave me a review on Apple or leave a rating on Spotify, this is an amazing way to support my efforts with this podcast as it's going to make the podcast more discoverable to new listeners. Equally, share this podcast across your social platforms. Just take a screenshot if you're listening on your mobile and post it on your story. I will be more than grateful. Now, wishing you all a successful week. Shine your light, be happy, and, well, if all goes wrong, at least we now have information on where to get that affordable burgundy. (laughs) Until next week, my friends, cheers to you.